This is the Average to Savage podcast with Paul Garino. Everyone and anyone, athletes, celebs, and much more. What's up, everybody? I'm back for another episode of the Average Savage podcast. Our special guest today is Antone Barnes. Antone, how's it going? I'm good. And yourself? I'm good. I appreciate you coming on. Oh, no. Nah, I appreciate you having me on. Very important topics. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Uh, your background already. You got, you're definitely oh, yeah. going to tell me about that eventually. Yeah, I'll go into that. You know, got some very fond memories of those days. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. So could you just uh, give us just like a little brief background about yourself? Okay. My name is Anton Barnes. I'm the founder and CEO of the brand Architects. We are a lifestyle and marketing uh, firm for professional athletes. Yeah. So how, how did you get into um, just working with athletes in, in sports? Well, the kind of, I guess you could say, touch on that, what you see in the background, you know, prior to me starting the brand Architects, I was a, I was one of the top record executive in the music industry. Uh, and while I was in the industry, I would meet a lot of athletes, of course, with all of the major concerts and all of the artists, the athletes were always around. And I would always have conversations with them in regards to like their marketing or what they like, what like they would, what they would like to do outside of sports. And a lot of them had a lot of interest, but they didn't know how to go about it, you know, or, you know, they were discouraged or talked out of it by their agents. The agents are the biggest pitfall. I'm going to just go, I'm going to dive right into it. They're always the biggest, uh, they're the biggest problem. And I'll go into more details about that later. But I found out like, okay, you know what? These guys really didn't have a plan B for life after football. And they didn't really, you know, how to, they didn't know how to express or get exposure for themselves. And that's when I started the brand architects. Gotcha. And what, uh, what year was that? This was 2009, 2010. Okay. Yeah. So then you said you were in, in music. So, um, just like what, what's been like maybe some differences and like similarities you've seen working in music and working in sports? Well, the similarities are very, very, very close. I mean, you know, I've worked with the likes of Jay-Z. Actually, you had one of my old clients on previously, Nelly. Um, you know, I worked at Universal Records. I've been on tour with Nelly. I, me and, trust me, we, me and that guy see each other. It's crazy. But, you know, the similarities are very similar. One day, you're at the top of the list, okay? And then next year, nobody's talking about you. So it's like, okay, while you're on this platform, while you're being talked about, while you're hot, what are you doing to diversify who you are to create opportunities outside of the music field? Like, you know, with Nelly, he had numerous opportunities in regards to clothing or, you know, movies, just diversifying your brand, using your brand to create opportunities outside of what you're just in the music industry. Because I would be on conference calls and we'll be talking about an artist that literally sold 10 million records. The next week we wouldn't even talk about them. They were relevant. They were gone. And, you know, a lot of similarities in sports. I mean, especially in the NFL, you know, all it takes is one hit, and now with the, uh, you know, with the salary cap, if you get to a certain year in the league where you are entitled to a league minimum, you will get phased out because they just don't want to pay you the amount of money that they will have to pay a second or third year player. So they come to abrupt ends from extreme highs. And it's like, okay, how do I use this while I'm on the high? Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Even like just the NFL is just that that's pretty much how it is. Just, I mean, I'm sure you just see, like, you know, just, like, especially, like, running back, it's just, like, one year. They're, like, like for example, like, Todd Gurley, like, they're talking about signing him now. He was literally, like, the poster boy for the whole, like, NFL, like, I don't know, three years ago, and now he's just out of the league somehow. It's exactly. Exactly. Derrick Henry just broke his foot today. Yeah, yeah so that's why, right. yeah, so maybe they'll We'll see him. how he comes back. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's an industry where, let's just be honest here, they will use you and beat you into the ground until they get everything out of you. And then when they're done with you, they dispose of you. And I call it the disposable athlete syndrome. And that's the reality of being a pro athlete that a lot of these athletes are not made aware of until they're done. And that's the problem. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then how did you like, who, who was your first client? And then how did you get into just like pitching them that you wanna help them build their brand like off the field? Vernon Davis. Vernon Davis is my very first client. Uh, you know, me and Vernon had very deep conversations prior to us working together. I was still in the music industry. I was at Universal Records at the time. 
I mean, I'm juggling Brian McKnight with cash money. I mean, I had all these artists going on, but you know what, I'll be honest with you, the music industry burnt me out as well too, because I saw the intentions of the music that we were putting out and I just morally couldn't do it anymore. So at the time me and Vernon were talking and Vernon had other interests. Ver Vernon at the time was only known as the guy that ran a 43840. I mean, and then being benched by his coach and cried on his draft day. He was like, Anton, there's more to me besides what's out in the world. There's things that I want to do. I like painting. I like design. I like this. I like that. These are all the things that I want to do, but nobody knows how, I don't know how to go about it. And a lot of it is lack of education. And a lot of it is lack of motivation. A lot of times these athletes have other interests and they're discouraged not to do it by their agents or coaches because they just want them to focus on football because guess what? That's the only thing the agents make money off of. That's the only thing that the agents care about. So they don't want them to think outside of that realm because guess what? That's not important to them. So Vernon, I mean, look at Vernon now. I mean, he's virtually a Renaissance man and he's living a life without regret, without having to go through an identity crisis that I call it, that a lot of athletes go through, which is the beginning onsets of depression. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I'll, I'll touch on both things. Um, I think you probably have been seeing it. I know we're both kind of in the same world. Uh, you know, like the big, even bigger athletes are either signing with a big agency and then signing with like a small marketing agency or, or vice versa. So it's like a cool new trend, uh, definitely for me and you, I'd say. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah. yeah, actually, I've seen Vernon Davis like a lot off the field branding stuff uh, just in the past. Like, so that's dope that you were a part of that. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, yeah, and just, just going into that quote unquote, I think I forgot the term you said, but I know like they go into, you know, a depression or don't know what to do after football and Identity things like that. Um, Identity. Yeah. Yeah, ident yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's just like, yeah, that's like a big topic now, you know, with mental health and all that. Um, so what, like, what are your thoughts on, on that stuff? You know what? Um, it's, it's finally coming out because the players are forcing the issue. Okay you know, the league and the powers that be, they didn't want this to come out. You know, it's been going on for decades, decades, you know, but now with the power of social media, and I think the power of athletes have realized that they hold within the past couple of years with, you know, the protest of George Floyd, the kneeling and everything. They realize like, okay, you know what? They really don't care about us as individuals. They only want us to just go out and perform for them. But just like everyone else, they're human beings. You know, when you go to the NFL, it's not a game anymore. It's a job. And everybody, people that are outside looking in don't realize that. Like, these men are dealing with every day fighting for their jobs. And this is while going through dealing with injuries. And that's very stressful, okay? And then since they've been teenagers, they've been told to just, they've been told what to do, how to do it, and where to go since they were teenagers. And a lot of that has just been based on sports. So it's like, okay, imagine someone, you've been doing something for 15, 20 years of your life and it's all abruptly taken away from you. And you're not prepared for that mentally or you're not prepared transitionally for that. What do you do? You, you panic because guess what? All of those people that were around prior are gone. So it's like, okay, you don't have that support system that you thought was going to be there and it's gone. And what we are, I call it, what we do is the reality check. You know, I, I tell my clients, I don't go to games. I don't talk about football. I really don't. You know, we are here for the man. We are here for the individual because without that, a lot of these young men go through mental breakdowns. Lane Johnson came out recently. Um, Calvin Ridley's taking time off to get his mental right. You know, it's like they've been, they've been so portrayed to just be go out there and be warriors but people don't know how, how, how deeply damaged they are inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. And yeah, I think it's like, it's great that everything is coming out now and you know, they're, yeah, that's why I like even the Calvin Ridley thing, it's going to be interesting on how, you know, the media sees it and treats it, how long it will be like, you know, if it, if it's longer than they might say like, Oh, like, is he ever going to come back or whatever or whatnot? Yeah. So that would be just like, you know, interesting. And obviously, you know, he's like a star player. So it's pretty interesting to see how that'll play out and, and things like that. And then, yeah. Lane Johnson won the Super Bowl. You yeah. know, he's all pro tackle and people, he's been battling this for decades, but yeah. he doesn't. And I think a lot of it is them talking about it, 
But I'll be honest with you, Paul, a lot of it too is that they don't have an outlet from football. Mm-hmm. I have clients, Chris Hubbard, who's a spokesperson for mental health and has been dealing with mental health issues himself since college, is so much better now because he doesn't just focus on football. It's like, okay, he has value away from the field. People think when you say value is just money, that's BS. No, value is you having something looking forward to every day, something that you like to do, something that you're interested, something that's part of you that you can actually do away from the field. That's value. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, and even just going back into, um, like, I lived with a bunch of football players in college, and I just remember, like, you know, we were at a low D1 school, so, you know, like, NFL wasn't that realistic. So it was just like, you know, I, I saw it myself, like my friends kind of going through, like, obviously I knew they had to get a job and things like that, but I knew it was hard for them to like give up football, even though yeah. they, I think they knew, but I think it was just like a weird segment cause they were at D one, but it wasn't like a high D one. So, you know, exactly. Yeah. I call it the athlete ego. You know, I tell my guys, listen, you know, you got to have an ego to a certain ex- extent to have to be successful in sports, but you, you got to turn it off when you leave the field because the real world will hit you harder than a blitzing linebacker. And a lot of them too, they don't, like I said, you have to have balance in life. That's everyone. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you have anyone, just everyone, like if I just focused on one thing and that one thing is taken, it's like having a portfolio, you invest all your money in one thing. That's unintelligent, correct? Yeah. It's the same when you invest in yourself. I tell them, listen, nobody's going to invest in you until you invest in yourself. So you have to have balance in your life. You can't just be an athlete. I'm sorry, because athletes are disposable. I don't care who you are. Michael Jordan at one point had to hang him up. Okay, so you, it's just some, it happens sooner than others. But the thing is, you have to prepare yourself for that. And a lot of them are trapped because like I said, I go back to the agents and the people in their circle, don't even want them to think outside, okay, you should just focus on football. No, you need to be worried about this as well, too, because football is going to be gone one day and basketball, whatever, all of them. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. Um, what are like what are some things uh, that you help your clients with, like to achieve those things that you like just mentioned? And like, what do you like suggest? Like maybe so say if an athlete doesn't know what they want to do, like where like how do you start? First thing I do is have a conversation about everything that they want to do besides sports. That's the first conversation I have with any of my clients before I even sign them. Like, okay, you know what? What do you like to do? I don't care if it's video games. I don't care if it's cooking. I don't know. I'm, I'm serious. I don't care if it's fashion. What do you like to do? And I'm not talking about sports. Okay. And a lot of them don't even realize that they're in a position that what they like to do can actually be a career path. Listen, you're a professional athlete. People are going to crack the door open for you. Where so, if you're somebody else, you got to pick the lock and work through it. No, they're like, hey, the door's here. Let's, you know, they're going to give you an opportunity. They're going to teach you that industry. It's the same way that you invest in getting to the levels you have to eat, right? You got to train, right? You got to train, you got to lift, you got to do all of this to advance in sports. You have to do the same in other industries. And I know, I know professional athlete schedules. Listen, listen, four or five months out of the year, they don't do anything. Okay. You work out in the morning, then you get, you don't do nothing. I know they schedule. They be like, oh, we ain't got time. That's BS. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. It's just a matter of how you utilize your time. Okay, so you got to have a balance. So the first thing I do is have that conversation on what they want to do, what they like to do, because guess what? That a lot of times that just sparks interest in them, that things just come out of nowhere that they'd be like, wow, nobody's even sat down and talked to me about these things. I'm like, yeah, because guess what? Most of the people around you only care about your football or basketball. That's it. And that's the first thing you do is spark, spark that interest in them to find out and figure out who they are as people not athletes. Yeah, no, nah, for sure. Like that's like uh, the same thing, kind of similar to what I do. I just kind of get to know the person. And then, you know, we're just talking about like life stuff and not the actual sport. I mean, obviously we still talk about, you know, sports and stuff, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, just talking about pretty much life in general. Um, like what are some, what are some like cool projects you got to work with um, with your clients? I mean, I, I can name a bunch. Rodney <laughs> McLeod with back of house, Rodney McLeod of the Eagles. He's, you know, he's like the poster child of it. I mean, you know, he's, he is a non, you know, Walter Payton man of the year nominee. He owns his own uh, uh, couture store because he's in the fashion called back of house. You know, he's currently a brand ambassador for Porsche. 
you know, Emmanuel Acho. I mean, Emmanuel Acho, we started his brand with taking a girl to the prom. And by that, from that, he was on the Rachel Ray show. And now look at him. I mean, literally three years after him, two years after that Rachel, um, that interview, he was out of the league, but Emmanuel Acho was making 10 times. He's basically the next Michael Strahan, you know? So, I mean, him doing into broadcasting, Vernon Davis doing movies now. I mean, we, Vernon Davis had a, a an interior design company. Vernon Davis had a art gallery, you know? And, you know, and he wasn't the greatest artist. Let's be honest, he wasn't a Picasso, mm -hmm. but he painted and he used that platform of being on the 49ers to have his fan base support that. So, you know, I could continue going down the line and it's like, okay, if you put it out there, opportunities will come your way. But a lot of them don't have an organization or a firm like mine to put it out there to attract people to enhance their individuality, I call it, okay? Because at the end of the day, you are an individual, okay? You play a team sport. Your sport is what you do, not who you are. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, I know you work with uh, primarily NFL players, but you do work with other athletes. And I saw you have some influencers too. So, um, mm -hmm. like, how do those – how did those like come about and like what like what makes you like you know go to football and then how did you like transition to other like sports it's all the same you know it's it's branding okay yeah. it's branding and branding is a combination of pr messaging social media you have to deliver a message that you want interpreted to do, that's going to benefit you i tell everyone everything that you put out has to have a purpose with every post that you make regardless, like we have influencers, we have, you know, fencers, they're all the same. Because it's like, at one point, you can't fence. Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to be able to be a fencer. One day that TV show is going to be taken away. You know, nothing lasts forever. That's what I tell everyone. And we all know this, especially in the entertainment industry. Entertainment industry turnover ratio is insane. But the entertainment industry opens doors for other outlets. And you have to use it while you're on that platform. So regardless of whether you're an entertainer, whether you're an athlete, whether you're an influencer, whether you're a businessman, okay? Everyone, every successful individual has a diverse entity about themselves. And you have to diversify yourself. And while you're doing one thing, learn other things. Because opportunities may present yourself with, hey, listen, okay, this road is kind of coming to an end. Now I can divert over here. Yeah, no, definitely. And then um, just, I know you're an entrepreneur yourself. So what, what advice would you give to a young entrepreneur? Young entrepreneur, I tell, I tell, I, the advice that I give is pretty much keep every option open. Um, you know, never, never dilute yourself, never pigeonhole yourself because you never know what one opportunity can take you. Now, hey, not every opportunity is good. There's a lot of shady people out there. We know that. But, you know, you, you have to make sure that you entertain or at least look into every opportunity to see how it could benefit you and, and, your, and your clients. Because if you're in a business and you're representing someone, relationships are everything. Let's be honest here. You know, relationships are everything. Never totally burn a bridge. Some bridges you got to totally burn, but some you don't, you know, because you never know where you may have to revisit someone or something. So uh, integrity is important, being a person of your word and just being honest, man. Cause there's a lot of, in this entertainment industry is a lot of shadiness, a lot of lies. I, I, I let, one thing I love about me and my team, we let our work speak for itself. I don't, I don't like people that's gonna tell me what they're gonna do. Tell me what you did, be that person. Tell, tell people what you did, not what you're gonna do. I like that. And then, all right, we got to go back into your, your music uh, career because oh, <laughs> I, I didn't, I had no idea. Uh, so I think it's pretty dope. Um, so you worked at <clears throat> Rockefeller, Loud Records and, and Universal. Um, yeah. Like, first of all, like what's like, what was it like to just work at like the major labels and, and what was your like experience at the, each one of them? You know, adult, that was the I, the, I call that the golden era. Um, I started at Rockefeller back in 90, I was at Rockefeller from 95 to 97. So that was the very beginning of Jay-Z. Uh, I think Jay-Z's first album, second album, DJ Clue's album, uh, Rel, I mean, I can't even go down the line. And then 97, I went 
Steve Rifkin snatched me up. I went over to Loud Records. So, I mean, I'm talking Wu Tang. I'm talking Mob Deep, uh, Big Pun. Uh, then, I, in 2001, I went over to Universal Motown, and first project was uh, Mr. Cheeks and Nelly and Cash Money. So, the experience in those days, music. How can I put it? The labels were very aggressive in regards to guerrilla marketing. When I mean guerrilla marketing, I'm talking street team. I'm talking in stores, I'm talking promo tours. Like we didn't have social media back then. We didn't have any of this. So we had to actually put in the work, you know, and we used to have to be out in the streets and we used to have to put up poster boards and almost get arrested by the cops. You know, we had to go to the clubs. We had to hit every club. I mean, there were times where I was on tour with an artist and we would literally have to hit four clubs in one night. And, um, you know, it's, I tell people like those were the golden eras because it was hands on. Now, even the music, like the music, I'm just being honest with you. The music nowadays is terrible to me. I'm like, oh God, what is this stuff? No, I'm being honest with you. It's it's garbage. I mean, the way that it's promoted. I hey, listen, I'm not in the industry anymore. So I don't care. So I'm like, listen, you know, the radio stations just play the same stuff, and it's just ever back then. Radio stations had the freedom to explore. You know, like Akon, I remember Locked Up. I, I was the first one to get Locked Up ever played on any radio station in the world. And it was a small station in Albany, New York. And, you know, Akon to this day thanks me for that, you know, because he was like, nobody gave me a shot. You know, back then it was about breaking new artists, whereas now they just follow. And it's just boring. It's terrible. Back then it was a lot, it was so much fun. The DJs could play whatever. I mean, the artists will actually go out into the clubs and be hands on. Now they're like, oh, it's just, and I'm talking about Jay-Z. We would walk through the clubs with Jay-Z. We walk through the clubs with Nelly, Cash Money, Akon. I mean, you name it. But now it's almost, it's so fickle and just like fake. And I'm just like, thank God I was in it when I was, <laughs> you know, I'm like, whatever, you know. And what, what, what is that plaque behind you? That's my Rockefeller Records plaque. What was that? The 10 million? Yeah, that was uh, 16 million in continued counting uh, record sales of, I mean, all of Jay-Z's albums, Benny Siegel, DJ Clue, Memphis Bleak. So yeah, that was awarded to me when we hit 16, minute, 16 million copies sold at Rockefeller. Yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah. so I guess it's safe to say you're not going back into the music industry. Yeah, you know what I, I can't. <laughs> I highly doubt it. I mean, you know, and probably for what I've said the past couple of years, they probably don't want my butt back. Cause yeah. I don't. It's it's I can't. I you know what with me, I have to believe in something to represent. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there's very few artists out there that I believe in. Like I like J Cole. Mm -hmm. I like um, you know, uh, there's very few. I can't even name anymore what. Oh, what's the one guy? There's one something the rapper. Oh, Chance uh, the rapper. Chance the rapper. Then there's another one. I can't even remember. I could count on one hand how many rappers I like that's out right now. And it's like okay, and that's why I left the music industry because I saw where it was going, mm -hmm. and I was literally depressed. I was like, I can't, I can't see myself promoting this if I don't even like it, yeah. you know. And it it just was it felt fake, and I couldn't do it. So. Well, no, I, I found my cause with what I do now because it means something is personal to me. And the music industry is part of the problem. You know, the messaging and the music that's put out there is misleading. It's degrading. And I can't be a part of that. I can't. No. Yeah, I got you. Um, yeah. How do you how do you, um, you know, approach athletes to, to work with them or like who do you like look look to work with? Well, you know what? A lot of it is referrals. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the athletes, um, my current, at my current clients, like, hey guys, you know, because a lot of athletes, and I'm sure you you'll have a few of them on your upcoming episodes, have very similar stories. A lot of them, and it's it's like a broken record. You know, they went from being the man and everybody kissing a butt and getting comfortable and playing sports, thinking that is never going to end, 
and never having that reality check person, like in their corner, like, hey, you know, it's going to end one day, right? What you got planned? Hey, what you, they all, and you'll be surprised how many of them tell, will tell you that their agent discouraged them from doing marketing outside of every one of them. So it's just like, I'm, it's like I'm battling, you know, these individuals and I have to do it because a lot of these young men are lost a lot of, and a lot of these, I'm not even gonna say that a lot of these young men have so much potential mm -hmm. and they're just great guys, but they have been put in and manipulated and lied to, to be put in a situation where they're made to be controlled yeah. instead of, you know, grown. Like, you know, I want these young men to grow. I want them to sprout because that's what's, that's what's encouraging to me. I want to be, I want to see them being successful when they're in their forties and fifties. You know, a lot of these guys, they, they think they hit their peak when they're in the twenties in the NFL. I'm like, no, you could continue to go. But a lot of them crash, but then they got to bounce back, you know, and that's the big thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like even, I don't know if you saw it today, like um, Body Armor, uh, Coke officially bought Body Armor, like the majority stake. And, and Kobe Bryant invested, I think it was $8 million, and now it, it just, it's worth $400 million. There you go. So, there you go. It was only in maybe, it was definitely less than 10 years. Maybe, I want to say maybe like six or seven. Yeah, yeah, exactly. His family is set. Yeah. It's like, okay, you know, you you do wise investments, but you also do things that's going to keep you occupied and keep you busy. You got to think about athletes are so used to getting up at 7, 8 in the morning to train. They're programmed. Let's be honest with you. They've been programmed since they were teenagers. Now they get up, there's nothing to do. Who am I? So it's like, okay, you have to, you have to reinvest that energy that you were putting into sports, into fashion, into cooking, whatever it is. Your other things that you like to do. I got guys that's coming out with CBD product lines. We all know what's going on with that. Guys that are into crypto, you know, other things that just things that's making them diverse individuals. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Are right, you ready for some fun questions? Let's go. All right. This is going to be funny because we were just talking about it. So what's your favorite song right now? Oh, man. <laughs> it, it has to be a current song. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't even know what's out, bro. Like, seriously, I don't even know. Listen, my playlist is pre-2005. I am so all right, what's your All right, what's your favorite hold song? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me pull my phone up. There's one rapper out that I do like, and I can't remember his name, bro. I, but the fact that I got to go on my phone and look it up, that goes to show you how out of touch I am. I'm like, man, listen, no. What's this dude? I, yeah, Tyler, the creator. I like that all kid. Right. And he has that song, Lumberjack. So that's that's the one current song that I like right now. I like Tyler the Kid's Lumberjack. The fact that I had to look it up is a shame. <laughs> All right, I'll take it. Uh, what do you what do you like to do in your free time? Oh man, you know what? I travel, man. You know, I travel, and I'm not talking about in the states. I travel around the world. You know, I like to learn other cultures. You know, my wife's French, so you know, and actually that's that's my target next home. Uh, so I like to visit other countries and other cultures and just sit down and just see how other people think and how they're wired and just exploring all those other things. I encourage, and that's one thing too, going back to my clients, every time, every time I sign a client within two years, they're obligated to travel somewhere within eight hours of flying time. Like not Mexico, no, not Jamaica, not Canada. No, you need to fly at least eight hours somewhere where you could get diverse. But you know what? when I do that, they, they thank me so much because they're like, you know what? I've never, it's, it's, eye, it's eye opening to them, you know? And I love that. So that's what I like to do in my spare time when I get there. Yeah. That's dope. All right. So, uh, well, I've been to DC before, but if I come to DC, uh, what, what's a food spot I would have to go to? Ooh, that's a good question. DC has a lot of actually pretty good restaurants, but, um, uh, there is one, you gotta go to Georgia Brown's. Georgia Browns is a, um, it's like a Southern cuisine, but on like, not, how can I say on a different level? It's, it's, it's such good Southern food and see DC is like on that border of the Dixie line. And it's like right in the middle, it's the mid Atlantic. Yeah. So you have a lot of people from the South that come in, but it's a dive. There's so many, there's so many, you have DC is a diversity. That's why I love it yeah. because you have different cultures. You have African food, you have Southern food. You have uh, Indian food, you got Asian. So I can't even put my finger on one, but Georgia Browns, you got to do Georgia Browns. All right, I'll take that. 
Uh, well, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, could you let the listeners know where they can follow you on social media? So you can follow me on Instagram at the brand arc, which is T H E B R A N D A R C H. Uh, Anton Barnes, A N T O N E B A R N E S on Twitter. And then go check out our website, thebrandarchitects.biz. And you can see everything we got cooking.